Moving on swiftly then to question three. So this relates to halogenoalkanes. So the first part of this question asks you to give the letter of the halogenoalkane that is highly unreactive of those listed. Okay. So only one of these uh, halogenoalkanes contains a fluorine atom, and that is compound D. So compound D is the highly unreactive halogenoalkane, and the reason for that is because the carbon-fluorine bond is much stronger than other carbon-halogen bonds, and as such is harder to break. And because it's harder to break, it means that a reaction is less likely to occur than with, say, a, uh, um, a compound that has an iodine atom in it. Okay? So there's just a bit of background explanation as to why the answer is compound D. So part B, halogenoalkanes can form alcohols by reacting with hot potassium hydroxide. So aqueous potassium hydroxide. So which of the above halogenoalkanes will react to form a diol? So a diol is a molecule with two OH groups. So all you need to do here is look for the molecule that has two halogens in it. And of the above uh, seven molecules, only one of them does, and that is molecule F, because there is a chlorine atom in there and an iodine atom in there. So the answer for that is compound F. And I should say for that last question, you get one mark. For this one, you also get one mark. So that's fairly simple, I think. So moving on to the next question. You need to draw the mechanism of the reaction between CH3, CH2, CH2Br, or 1-bromopropane, and hot potassium hydroxide using the curly arrow model. You need to state the name of the mechanism, and you also need to include any relevant dipoles. You'll see an emergent theme. One thing I will say, even if a question doesn't ask you to include the relevant dipoles, it is always a good idea to actually put dipoles on the molecule because it means that you have a better idea. You can see where the molecule might react. Okay, So that's just a personal recommendation from me. Feel free to use it. So anyway, question three, part two. So let's draw this mechanism. So I'm going to represent the molecule like this just because it makes it easier to see what's going on in this mechanism. So. We've got two hydrogen atoms there that I've missed. Okay. And you've also got an OH there, that's your nucleophile, and that's got a negative charge on it. So there's your hydroxide ion. Okay. So here is your molecule, this is your uh, one bromopropane. So from here, what you want to be doing is adding these dipoles. So as you are aware, halogens are typically very electronegative. So you've got a delta minus there, you've got a delta positive there. So now you've drawn the dipoles on, you can see where this is likely to react. So the lone pair of electrons on the hydroxide ion is going to attack the electron deficient carbon atom, the slightly positive carbon atom, forming a new bond. And then this will in turn break the bond between the carbon and the bromine. So the bromine is a very good leaving group, uh, and I'll discuss that more in a second. So you have this occur, and what you form is you form OH plus Br minus. So remember, you have to conserve the charges. So the charge on one side of the reaction equation will always be identical to the sum of the charges on the other side of the reaction equation. Okay. So you've got a propan one ion, and you've got a bromide ion. So bromide ions are very stable in solution, so they leave easily. Yeah? And you know that a carbon bromide bond, carbon bromine bond is quite weak, which is why it breaks in this nucleophilic substitution reaction. So there's a clue as to what the name of the mechanism is. As you can see, uh, you have uh, the OH minus here, which is a nucleophile because it is an electron pair donor. So this is a nucleophilic reaction. And what this nucleophile causes is a substitution. So the OH minus uh, the OH here substitutes for the Br, so the hydroxide substitutes for the bromine. So what you get here 
is a nucleophilic substitution. I'll just make sure I've spelled that right. Yes, I think I have. That's good. So, how many marks do you get for that? Well, you get one mark for the name of the mechanism. You may have also heard this called an SN2, so like that. You will also get a mark for saying it's an SN2 reaction, but as far as I'm aware, this is only covered on the Edexcel exam board. Okay, so there's one mark for the name of the mechanism. You get one mark for this curly arrow here. You get one mark for this curly arrow here, as well as the dipole. So you need to have that curly arrow and the dipoles correct to get that mark. And you also get a mark for correct product structure. Okay, so that's where the marks are distributed for this question. And so the final part of question three, drags on a little bit this one, is that a student reacts to these halogenoalkanes with hot potassium hydroxide and measures the rate of reaction. She observes that the reaction of C with hot potassium hydroxide is slower than the reaction of B. So what is the reason for this reaction? Well, the CI bond, the carbon iodide bond, is weaker you can say it's weaker than the uh, carbon bromide bond, or you can also say that it is uh, has a lower bond en enthalpy. So it has a lower bond enthalpy, or it is longer. We can say it's longer than the CBr bond, and therefore, I hope you can read my handwriting. The CA, CI bond, sorry, is easier or it requires less energy to break. And therefore, reaction is faster. So, to get the mark for this question, you need to say both of these points. So you need to make it clear that the carbon iodide bond is weaker than or longer or has a lower bond enthalpy than the carbon bromine bond. And you also need to say that therefore the carbon iodide bond is easier to break or requires less energy to break. So you get one mark for saying all of that. So that's question three, pretty long one, but I think once you get a hang of it, it seems pretty simple.